Hi, welcome to Chad Silversmithing. Uh, first, thanks for coming to my channel. I really appreciate you visiting. Um, I wanted to thank my subscribers uh, who've been growing in number. I really appreciate everybody signing up and all the nice comments and input that I get and all the constructive criticism. I appreciate those things. It helps me to improve the channel. Um, I wanted to give a special thanks to um, Nikki from Nikki's uh, Custom Designs who signed up for my Patreon at the third tier. So I really appreciate her support and uh, if you're someone who'd be interested in uh, checking out the features over at Patreon uh, or uh, my website or uh, any of the other relevant links, uh, you might check out the video description for some of those. Uh, there's all sorts of great stuff over there like uh, exclusive tutorials, uh, a monthly challenge, uh, back uh, behind the scenes content, and just a, a, a growing community of people who are sharing ideas and uh, helping each other learn. So uh, it's a good place and I'm enjoying being part of it. Just about every online silversmith has a, a video about making stacking rings and uh, I'd hate to be the exception to that. But uh, my video today is going to be about that but it's also going to be about why you probably should be making some stacking rings if you're a person who is planning on selling your jewelry. Um, there's a lot of good reasons for it and I can show you a couple of variations. Uh, most of the videos online you see are showing basically the same idea over and over again. So I'll show you those ones but I'll also show you how to make a couple of variations that are a little bit different. So. Um, with that being said, let's get started. So I uh, first learned how to do this um, discipline or started my journey learning how to do this kind of stuff uh, back in about 1995 or thereabouts. And, um, you know, pretty quickly you start uh, getting to the point where you're, uh, you're making all sorts of jewelry and you need to do something with it. You can only give it to your friends so much. At some point or another, you're going to want to start getting rid of some of that pile that you're building up. And um, so you're probably going to sign up for a craft show or an art show. Now, um, that's the pathway that I followed. And uh, luckily, I, when I first started teaching classes, uh, I think for adults that was back in about 2003, um, I met uh, someone who became my friend uh, and does shows with me. And uh, she and I started doing shows you know, shortly thereafter. Um, I don't know how many times uh, I went to a show, especially things like uh, craft shows around the holidays, and uh, you know, you'd sign up for it, you'd have all sorts of uh, really pretty stuff that you've made, and uh, you get there and you set it all up and you're, you have high hopes and expectations to, to make all sorts of money, and then uh, you don't sell a single thing the whole weekend. Everybody just, you know, squawks about how beautiful your stuff is and nobody buys anything and uh, that brings up uh, several other discussions about what types of shows you should do uh, however um, most of the ones I do well at are art or craft shows in the summertime outdoors uh, sometimes in, in touristy kind of places uh, are pretty good um, but generally the kind of like uh, juried art shows in parks and stuff are the, the kind of way I, I do the best. Um, but when I first started doing those too, I had lots of um, you know very you know unique pieces that I made uh, that I thought you know wow these are going to be great for this artsy place. Um, and you know you'd sell a piece or two, um, but you still occasionally would have a show where you you had a big zero goose egg. Uh, and so you ended up uh, eating the cost of the show and all the time that you put into it. Um, what I hadn't figured out yet was uh, that you need to have uh, different price points for the different groups of people who come through because um, I had lots of high-end pieces in the you know 250 to 300 dollar range which is pretty high for a piece of silver jewelry uh, in a show sort of situation and there's very few of us who have the discretionary income to just drop you know two or three hundred dollars without you know at least thinking pretty seriously about it and so um, having exclusively that kind of stuff limits your audience that you're reaching um, it's been my experience that when people are uh, going to visit those kind of shows 
they're usually having a good time. Um, some of them have uh, a little bit of uh, alcoholic lubrication in them if it's that kind of a show. And um, they want to have some sort of thing to remember the show by uh, or the good time that they had. They have an emotional connection to it and they'd like some kind of physical thing to remind them of it in the future. And um, so if you have some things that are in different price ranges, just about anybody who wanders along can walk away from your booth with something that they purchased from you. If you have all high-end stuff and you don't sell a single piece, you don't make any money whatsoever. So, um, so it's good to have some trickle-in kind of money going on the whole time. Sometimes it'll pay for the entire show. And uh, that's where stack, uh, stackable rings come in. They're, they're a perfect example of the kind of thing that you can make some money with. My friend and I were doing a, a, a show in, I think it was in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, the whole weekend, uh, you know, lots of people looking at stuff and everybody loved everything, but nobody was buying a single thing. And I don't think I had sold a single piece. And uh, all of a sudden this, this older lady um, and this older gentleman showed up and she just loved uh, my friend's stuff and started making this pile of uh, really expensive pieces, like $300 pieces. And she ended up spending like, uh, well, I don't know if she spent it, but she made the pile of jewelry and uh, the older gentleman who was with her then uh, whipped out a credit card and paid for it. So, um, but it was, it was a, uh, it's one of those rare things. We, uh, my friend and I, we call it someone who's going to make a pile now because of that. So it's always exciting when someone shows up at your booth and starts making a pile without really thinking about the prices or anything because you know you got somebody who, who doesn't really have to worry about that kind of stuff. That, however, is not most of us. You know, Most of us have to think hard before we spend $100 on something. But it's a lot easier for me to spend 20 bucks or $40 um, on something pretty casually. So. If you have stuff in that price range, uh, you make a lot of little sales, and sometimes that adds up. So that's a, a useful tactic to keep money coming in, even if it's sort of a slow show. So where do stackable rings come into this? Stackable rings, uh, uh, I make some skinny ones, and, and they're just little uh, skinny bands of varying um, types, and I'll show you how to make a couple of them. Uh, then I'll create a bowl full of uh, sizes, maybe five, six, seven, eight, of maybe you know five to six different variations, uh, and all those different sizes. So you end up with a, a, a little bowl. I usually use a little wooden bowl that has you know 50 or 60 rings in it of all different sorts, and uh, people love going through that kind of stuff. And I'll see people digging through those whole you know over and over again, trying to find just the right one for themselves. And, uh, and so that, I get a lot of sales on those kind of things. The other thing about little stackables like that, there's very little material in them. So the overhead for those ones is almost zero. It's just the time it takes to make them. And generally they're not very hard to make. So, uh, once you get a little, a conveyor belt system going with your, with your stackables, you can make them pretty fast and pretty efficiently. Um, so what I usually do is I'll have a big pile of them and I'll sell them for $15 a piece or $25 for two um, or $35 for three. And so um, you get a lot of people who just buy the one. So you're making more money on those, but you get a, about a 50% chance of them buying a second one too as well. So uh, I, that seems to improve sales as well. It's a, it's a way to drive up a few more dollars into your pocket while you're if you have uh, even more variations than five or six, uh, it's really intriguing to people because they keep finding, when they're digging through the pile of stuff, they keep finding all these different variations. And uh, it's intriguing when you, when you keep hoping to find something new. And, and you eventually usually settle on something that's, you know, like there's maybe one of them left and that's the one they want. So um, you could also, uh, like that's, that's one price point. Uh, you could also have a little bit fancier ones. Uh, the, you know, each one with a little stone on it or something for a higher price point, and you can do the same discount as they buy more than one. Um, so you could hit uh, multiple different price points there. Uh, 
I usually keep uh, some pattern wire bands uh, and some just plain half round silver bands of varying sizes that I sell for 20 to 25 dollars a piece as well which is another mid-range kind of low to mid-range price that so somebody can find something to take home with them as a souvenir. And one of the tricks that I do to speed up the process is uh, if I'm going to make a whole bunch of these guys, uh, one thing, this is the kind of thing you could probably watch TV with while you're doing and just kind of knock out a whole bunch of these. Because it's, uh, to be honest, it's a little boring making the same thing over and over again, even if you're changing up the sizes and stuff. But it's a good policy to have something like this on. So when I'm going to make a whole bunch of these and I want to have some various sizes, I'll, I'll cut some little templates for the sizes like this out of paper. That way I don't have to keep uh, looking at a chart or anything. I can just line up the piece of wire and snip off some fours. Say I'm making six different kinds. I'll snip off a four out of each one of those, or two fours out of each one, and then two fives out of each one, and two sixes out of each one. So there's you know a variety of sizes and styles. Um, but it's nice having the sizes all set out like this, pretty easy to access, so you can do it quick. So something else about the sizes, the wires that we're using, you know, are generally thin for these kinds of rings. And so um, one of the things you can do at the show, if you have somebody who can't find one that fits, or you're getting low on them, or they just have weird fingers or something, you know, <laughs> don't tell them they have weird fingers. But, um, you can stretch these really easily on a mandrel if you just have a plastic hammer like this. So you can stretch them up to a couple of sizes most of the time, as long as you solder them well. Um, so you can change the size on them. And that would be a, uh, you know, if they're trying to get away because they can't find a, a size that fits, you can recapture their, sa their sale with, uh, <laughs> you can tell I'm not really a salesman. I'm trying to talk like a salesman, but I'm not. Uh, you can bring them back sometimes if you can tell them that you can make the ring right in front of them fit their finger. So that's kind of a nice selling point sometimes. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you um, just a couple of variations that I haven't seen much uh, on other people's back ring videos. You know, most of them I don't put a huge amount of effort into them because I'm not going to sell them for very much. So I don't do anything too fancy. Like just twisted rope wire is good, this kind of stuff. You can make little ones of those. You can make multiple variations of these, like uh, you know, three three wires or different gauge wires, or you could flatten it out so it has a different look to it. Um, I've done super thin wire where I I did this and then I folded it in half and did it again, and did that uh, twice. I think I was using 26 gauge wire or something like that, and that came out pretty cool too. Uh, if you uh, soldered it into a ring. So um, you can take just square round wire and you can hammer it with a, a peen or, or some, some kind of texturing hammer. There's all sorts of different things you can do like that. Um, I'm going to do some, you don't see this very often, so I'm going to do it just to be different. Uh, I got some triangle wire here. I think it's number seven from Rio, if I remember right. You can make little ones that have little cutouts with the saw that are pretty easy to do to change things up. So I thought I'd make one of those here. So I got the size 7 template here, so I'm going to cut one of these guys off. And the other one I'm going to do is I have a... Uh, and you, could, you can texture things in a lot of different ways. I'm going to show you a... a this, this was a piece of 14 gauge square that I ran through the rolling mill a couple of times to kind of squish it flatter and wider. And then now I'm going to run it through the rolling mill with uh, a texture plate and then we'll have kind of a unique little uh, ring that's skinny and stackable. So we'll do, do one of those. And those will be the two main types that I'm going to show you today. But I'll show you examples of the other types and, and talk about how I did them as well. So, all right, make this guy seven as well. I think the ones I made that I'm going to show you earlier were size eights. So. Mm -hmm. Get these guys filed flat a little bit. This one now.
So this one I can make into a band before I do what I'm going to do to it. This one uh, I'll need to run through the rolling mill with a texture plate, so let's do that next. You can use whatever kind of texture plate you want. You can even make a homemade one if you want, which I do sometimes. This one had a pretty aggressive pattern in it, so I thought I'd do this one just to see how it came out. I found that no matter which way you turn the thing on the rolling mill, it always goes the opposite direction you think it's going to go. That's kind of cool. That'll make for an interesting pattern, I think. Okay, let's make it into one. I'm just going to kind of rush through making these into bands. If you, uh, I have a video about it. It's a little bit on the older side, so the editing may be a little bit rough, but I'll put a link up there for the uh, making a silver band video. Uh, but I do it in a number of videos, so you could also look at the triple ring, uh, triple band rolling ring that has making some bands in it. Okay, so the ring man, I'm just gonna kind of make this into a U shape. Those are these. Bring these ends together. I'd be just picking up some solder that I had on the pad from earlier. These guys are soldered nicely. solder on the inside of these. One thing when you're when you're making these, um, since they're going to stack, you want to make sure you don't have any wobbles in them like this. So I will spend some time getting those wobbles out. You can use the pliers sometimes. Um, sometimes I will use plastic headed hammer on my little anvil surface uh, to just kind of pound it a little bit to see if you can get most of those waves out of there and that sometimes works. I get a lot of the big ones out just by doing this though. This one I'm going to clean it up on the edges just a little bit to file so it's all symmetrical.
cool thing about the pattern ones are the uh, ones with the rolling mill. Are, uh, if you have a whole bunch of those different patterns, you could really up the variety people had to choose from. Um, that might be worth looking into. Alright, let's clean this one up a little bit on the sides as well. So I'm going to heat this one up and throw it in the pickle. Um, this one, I'm going to cut some things out with a saw on the, on the side to give it some unique features. So let's go like about thirds. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go over the saw and I'm going to cut out some patterns on here using these as, as guides. Okay, here's my fancy new saw. So let's start off. I'm just going to cut a straight line in on this side. I'm going to go more than about two-thirds of the way through, though. Okay, so I got a bunch of little cutouts of varying shapes. that pickle for a while and then I'll show you some uh, a few other designs and sh show you how these ones came out and that should do it so did a little bit of polishing and stuff so you could see what these look like when they're all done um, so here's the one that uh, I made with the rolling mill with the, with the texture plate there. I actually made one earlier today um, with a more subtle texture plate and it's uh, it's not quite as flashy as that one. So that's one of those things you get numerous different texture plates and make textures that way. Um, you know one I didn't do but you could do a reticulated one of these that would be kind of cool. Um, this is one that I use a lot because a lot of people seem to like this style. It's just 14 gauge round wire made into a ring and then I just use my little chasing hammer like that and just make little kind of flat spots all the way around and it's kind of glittery and catches people's eyes. I seem to like that style. Um, twisted square wire is always a good, a good one really catches the light nicely, stands out. So if you've never uh, twisted wire, I have a, a video about that. Check out the link up there. Um, here's regular round wire, uh, two, two strands of round wire twisted together. I think this is 20 gauge. I usually use 18, but if you had some that was both gauges, it would add some variety in there for people to dig through your bowl of rings. Um, like I said before, you could also flatten this out so it has a different look to it. That would give some variety. Um, this one is 14 gauge round wire. I really like this one because it gets quite glittery. And what I did with that was uh, on the ring mandrel. Just have it there. And then the sharp edge of the chasing hammer right here. If you hit it over and over like that, and work your way around a couple of times, that makes for a nice kind of glittery texture that catches the light. I like that one a lot. 
those are pretty popular. These ones, uh, we were talking earlier about uh, having maybe some higher end stackables. These ones are just triangle wire that I did. Uh, I made into a ring and then I used the saw to cut out some designs on the outside. So the reason I say these ones might be a little bit uh, higher end stackables with some other types of stackables that you make that are different that also require a little bit more work like these ones. You might set the price range on these ones to be, you know, uh, $25 a piece and, you know, two for 40 or something like that, um, since they require a little bit more work. So, but those are some variations. There's a, there's a zillion different kinds of things you could do. Um, if you want to make one that is all balls all the way around, I, I wouldn't try to use actual silver balls. I would use that uh, wire that looks like silver balls that you can buy uh, because it, it's a lot more malleable rather than having all those little solder joints around there, which will probably crack if you try and bend it if you solder a bunch of balls together. Lots of little skinny pattern wires you can buy. Those would be great for stackable rings too. Um, you know, the more variety you provide, the more likely somebody's probably going to walk away from your booth with a, a new ring. So um, I like the fact that this gives people who, like me, are on a little bit tighter budget most of the time uh, a way to make a purchase that they'll have some kind of a memory uh, from the event uh, as a keepsake. So oftentimes it, it uh, pays for the show if you have enough of these little low-end things. So, um, Like I said, there's, a, there's lots of variations, lots of different ways you can texture things. Um, Know, hammering things in different ways produces all sorts of different textures. Uh, experiment and play around with uh, different variations. But like I said, you know, have a lot of varieties in the same same bowl. I like little wooden bowls like this. Have about 50 rings in here. And people will just spend a long time at shows digging through those, looking for the one that they like that fits them. You know, just make sure you you keep a wide variety of sizes. Well, thanks for watching my video. I really appreciate it. Um, if you enjoyed what you found here, would you make sure to hit the like button? And I would really appreciate it if you'd subscribe. Uh, we have a growing membership here. It doesn't cost you anything to sign up. And uh, if you want a more personalized experience, you can check out my Patreon uh, or my website. Uh, the links to both of which are in the video description down below. So uh, make sure to leave a comment. Uh, I'd love to hear your ideas about uh, stack rings and what you guys do for, for yours uh, or variations that, that you make or ideas you have about them. Uh, you know, feel free to comment in the section down below. I like to read those and interact with you guys. It's fun. So get into your shop and make some stack rings so you have some low-end price items for your shows that you're doing this summer. So, so I think that's pretty much all I have to say about stack rings. but. Uh, I may show some other variations in a future video, uh, but for the time being, hopefully this will keep you occupied for a while. Uh, take care. Happy silversmithing.